is weird, odd, strange, or just plain bizarre is really your cup of tea. Then, the Golden State Media Concepts Weird News Podcast will give you that fix. Can't believe it? Well, listen for yourself as we deliver the strangest news you definitely won't find on CNN or Fox. It's the Golden State Media Concepts Weird News Podcast. Thank you for joining us for the GSMC Weird News Podcast, brought to you by the GSMC Podcast Network. I am your host, Moog. Hello, everybody. This week, we're going to talk about babies, lots of babies, lots of children. We're talking about twins conceived at different times. We're going to talk about the little girl, Journey, who got her hair ruthlessly chopped off. We're going to talk about premature babies and incubators and the invention of that back in the early 1900s and how incubators changed the outcomes for preemies permanently. What else? Tic-tac-toe, of course, as always. And if you've ever wondered about spanking, I cover a lot of that, about the science behind that. I am not a scientist. I read several articles. I'm an article woman. My dad was an article man. I'm an article woman. Yeah. So we're going to be talking about a lot of fun stuff and stick around. I may, I don't know if I'll have time, but I want to get to talking about... The, um, the manatee power plant that I did not know about until my last trip to Florida. Oh, by the way, I am broadcasting from Louisville, Kentucky, because I am just finishing up a journey this week. I drove down to Florida from Chicago. It was a long, arduous trip. It was stressful. Then I got there. It was more stressful. And then it was really fun for two days. And then I got back in the car. And it was stressful. And now it's really fun for one day because I decided to stop in Louisville where it's really nice because I'm staying at the Hyatt Regency and I'm swimming in the pool. And I ordered (laughs) DoorDash. I never ordered DoorDash, but they don't serve food anymore. In America. What are you going to do? Well, I don't mean in America. I mean at this particular hotel and at many places because they got rid of their dining and their food and their room service. They got rid of everything. And so... Let me, I think I need to start a segment called First World Problems because I, let, let me complain. The, um, the parking, they charge you for parking here, fine. But if you want to leave and come back, they charge you double. And the only way to get food is to leave. And they don't serve food here, so you have to leave to get food. <laughs> so this is my first world problem I would like to complain about. That in order to get food. You have to literally pay the Hyatt Regency in Louisville. You have to pay them double the parking fee in order to leave and come back to get food because they don't sell it here. And I'm just thinking like, okay, if you know that you stopped serving food because of a pandemic, can you just not, can you just knock it off with the charging the people to leave to go get food and come back? Can we, can you just not? So that's first world problem number one. So I hate to, I'm going to say it. I had a better experience at the Super 8 Motel last night in uh, Calhoun where I could drive my car to my door and walk from my car to my door about 12 feet and unload whatever I need to unload and be good. They also had a pool. They also had continental breakfast and you didn't have to walk across a very long walk of a, um, of a parking garage and then like muddy puddles. It was crazy at the Hyatt Regency. You have to, there's no one at the front door. There's no valet. There's no um, valet carts, those carts that you move all your stuff on. There, so there's nothing like that. There's no carts. There's no people. There's no valet. There's nothing. So you just have to park your car up in the parking garage, bring all your stuff by hand from your car to the elevator of the parking garage and then down. And then there's like all these puddles everywhere. There's like mud puddles and you're like sloshing through mud puddles and walking quite far because there's no other option. There's no other option. And I literally had a better experience at the Super 8 Motel, although I'm lying because first world problem number two at the Super 8 Motel, they're like, you know, checkouts 11, no problem. At 10.57 a.m., I get a knock on my door. Not a phone call, like a full-on knock at my door. And the housekeeping said, housekeeping. And I was like, yeah, I'm going to leave in a, I'm gonna leave in a few minutes, yep. And she opens the door and stares at me and is like, 
it's checkout time. You have to go. And, I, and it's literally before 11. It is a few minutes before 11. She accessed my room and stared at me and told me to leave. And guess what? What are you doing three minutes before checkout? I don't know what you're doing, but I know what I'm doing. I'm getting dressed. So I'm literally getting dressed. I am not fully clothed. She walks in, looks me straight in the eye, and tells me to leave. And she opened the door without my permission. Aggressive much? It was it was very shocking. So that was a very negative experience. I just don't like on what planet is like ten fifty seven like the do or die time that you like you have to go in and like rough people up and like kick them out of rooms <laughs> like. I hope they don't do that here at the Hyatt Regency in Louisville. Am I going to get sued for slander? Am I going to be censored? And like, you'll just, whenever I say the name of it, it'll just like be a beep or a moment of silence because they don't want to deal with the ramifications of me talking shit about um, two reputable businesses that, except for the times that I've interacted with them, probably every other person on earth was like, hell, the Super 8 Motel in Calhoun was the best place I've ever been. What are you talking about? And meanwhile, the very mean housekeeper ruined my life. Okay. It's great. We've done it. We've done, um, first world problem number one, first world problem number two, and that takes us to first world problem number three, where I'm going to complain some more. Oh my God. Don't you just hate yourself sometimes you guys like where you're like have first world problem number three. So, but come on, you guys, you know that we all have these moments where we're like, oh, some woman walked in on me and ruined my morning. I'm like, first world problem, kid. Okay, first world problem number three is that uh, this, this stressful journey I took and all that, it was to get a car, okay? Come on. It was to get a I traded in my old, got a new, and I love my new car, happy as can be. It just, you know, the down and back, it was stressful. And I made it stressful by being like, I'm going to drive there in two days, stay two days, well, day and a half, and drive back because that's all the time I have. I just, um, you know, coming into my weekend, I do this podcast, so I could only, I could only do so much. And I'm here in the beautiful state of Kentucky just doing my thing here. So yeah, I only had this week and then heading on towards the weekend, I'm headed back and need to live my life, just need to live my life. So I only had a few days to make it happen and I'm very happy I did it. But I did it in a way that caused myself stress, and I'm aware of that. So that's first world problem number three, and I hope I don't have any more. Can we just leave it there? I did have the pool all to myself. And, ooh, in honor of my grandma, she's about to turn 93 in a week, I did 100 kicks in the pool of the Hyatt Regency <laughs> because my grandmother always does 100 kicks when she swims. She goes up to the shallow part. It's usually in a lake or a pond or an ocean, but sometimes. So then she just puts her hands down and she does a hundred kicks. And so I did my hundred kicks. I still have yet to figure out if it's like, does two kicks equal one, like one rotation of kicks, or does two kicks equal two? So because I don't know the answer to that, I just do two sets of 50 sets of two, which is a hundred twice. But I, I don't want to be, I don't want to be doing 50 kicks when I should be doing a hundred. I'd much rather be doing 200 kicks instead of a hundred as I got to keep I got to do this in honor of my grandmother, Grandma Maisie. Yep, that's my fun fact. So anyone out there, do your 100 kicks and think of my Grandma Maisie. She's incredible. She's really incredible. Be like Maisie. So let's get started with our first weird news. Now, this isn't weird. This is just cruel. A little seven-year-old girl from Michigan got her hair chopped off by her library teacher. And this is just days after she had already been bullied for her hair on the school bus ride home and her parents had already had to take her to a salon and get her hair fixed once already and then this happens so so let's i'll i'll read the article this is from people titled dad pulls biracial daughter out of school after classmate and school employee cut her hair quote she was crying she was afraid of getting in trouble for cutting her own hair a father in Michigan has transferred his biracial seven-year-old daughter to another school after a classmate and a school employee cut the child's curls. Jimmy Hoffmeyer revealed his daughter Journey came home on March 24th with one side of her hair cut by a few inches by a classmate. As a result, he took Journey to a local hair salon where they gave the seven-year-old an asymmetrical hairstyle to disguise the chop. The hair salon also offered to give Journey free haircuts until the shortened side grew back. Days later, Hoffmeyer said his daughter came back with the other side of her hair cut and later discovered it was a school employee who did it. She was crying. I asked what happened. 
And I said, I thought I told you no child should ever cut your hair. And she said, but dad, it was the teacher. The teacher cut her hair to even it out. Hmm. I can't imagine having the audacity, the entitlement, if I were a teacher, to think I could cut a child's hair without permission from the parent that, the, you know, maybe the child felt pressured. I mean, did the child really go, please, please, please cut my hair? <laughs> I, I can't imagine pushing that, like that agenda, thinking I had the right. Wow. Wow. Like just tell the parent, hey, your kid wanted a haircut. I obviously don't have the right to give a kid a haircut, but she told me she wanted a haircut. So now you have that information. Have a nice day, Hoffmeyers right? Like, isn't that how you handle this? <laughs> okay. So after this instance, when the child cut the, the little girl's hair, Superintendent Jennifer Vergler, Ver, Verliger offered to write Journey an apology, an apology card to a seven-year-old who is humiliated and has to be around her classmates like this. While the father said he doesn't want to make an incident about race, he said, it's hard to come to any decision when you don't have answers to why it was done. I still want to know what justifies a teacher cutting a child's hair without their parents' permission. Any of this could have been resolved with a phone call. That's what I just said. <laughs> um, he added, she doesn't understand what's wrong with her hair. Yeah, that's, that's a great point. That is poignant. She doesn't understand what's wrong with her hair. Exactly. She's on the bus. Someone has a problem with her hair. She, her, her library teacher. Oh, let me fix your hair. It's like, imagine being a seven-year-old and just everyone has a problem with you. With your hair. Your hair's not good enough. It's not straight enough. It's not this enough. Whatever their problem is. Like, can you just even imagine? Maybe, maybe there are millions of people out there who have had this experience, but I was lucky enough that, I, I mean, no one had a problem with my hair. I just got to feel like a normal kid. Uh, uh, I got to feel like a kid. We're saying normal is pushing it. So a few days ago when this first came out, I, I kept being like so mad at this teacher. Like, why did this teacher do it? Like, that teacher just hated her, hated her hair. Like, why would this teacher take it upon herself? And I couldn't understand the point of view of that teacher. And and so now, several days later, it's kind of been updated. And the school stated that Journey, quote, grew unhappy and dissatisfied with the way her hair looked after the other student cut it and asked a school library employee to fix her hair during a classroom visit to the library. And the employee, quote, agreed to even out the student's hair to make her feel better. And I still say, didn't she just come back from the salon? where the salon person evened out her hair. I, I guess, I mean, it is absolutely possible that Journey just hated the, the, fi the fix that the hairdresser did. That's absolutely a possibility. But the outcome of a teacher having the entitlement to take these steps, you are smarter than that. You're an adult. You know better. And just side note, I apologize for all the, maybe the city noises like airplanes and trucks and the air conditioning clicking on and off. It's a little bit loud in this Hotel room. Moving on. Uh, Journey's teacher was made aware that the librarian planned to cut the child's hair without her parents' permission. Quote, Regardless of their good intentions, these actions are unacceptable and show a lack of judgment on the part of our two employees. Both employees have admitted their actions and apologized. Both are being reviewed for further disciplinary action in accordance with our school policies and procedures. I have personally apologized to the family on behalf of the school district. Journey's father is now working with the National Parents Union in relation to this incident. The organization released a statement in response to the school's statement, which read, We do not find placing blame on Journey Huffmeyer is the best way to offer remorse and accountability. If this nation is serious about combating and eradicating systemic racism, the way we protect our children from it will be the greatest determining factor. Okay, so they're saying, if we want to pretend we're not a racist country, it starts young. It starts with how we treat our children, how we teach our children. Yeah, I just can't imagine being in a similar position where people are having opinions about my hair or wanting to fix my hair because no one has ever focused on my hair because I have that privilege of having hair that people don't focus on. And so I think it's, a, I think it's hard for people to change that perspective. Imagine if you were the odd man out. Imagine if you're some physical part of your body that you had no control over was bugging people or looked funny to people, or stuck out in some way. And, and the, the solution was to make that thing go away. And then, and 
I mean, I don't think we all can truly appreciate that. And so I think a lot of people will downplay these moments and be like, ugh, you know, everyone makes everything a, such a big deal. And I think if that's your reaction, then you haven't ever been in that position where something that's completely out of your control, the way you look, the size of your nose, your skin color, the texture of your hair, your height, your weight. Um, and yes, your weight can be out of your control. Genetics are strong. If you are destined to be real thin, if you are destined to be incredibly bootylicious, <laughs> you, your genetics are coming through. You can eat at one carrot a day and you're still going to have a different body than someone else who has different genetics than you. Enough about that. I send in my love to this this little girl and all the little girls who have been made to feel like their hair was a problem. Absolutely ridiculous. We are going to come back right after this with some TikTok toe, something a little lighter, where we're going to be talking about more children and babies. This whole episode is going to be hugely about children, babies, parenting, and I don't know why, because I'm not a child or a baby or a parent. <laughs> so we'll be right back after this. Are you tired of the same old news? Are you sick of the seemingly endless political spin and negativity? The GSMC America Still Beautiful podcast is a weekly news podcast covering all the top positive and uplifting news stories. We cover stories that will inspire, uplift, and remind you of the good in the world. Tune into the Golden State Media Concepts America Still Beautiful podcast to get all the great and positive news stories of today. Download the GSMC America Still Beautiful podcast on iTunes. Stitcher, SoundCloud, Google Play, or anywhere you find podcasts. Just type GSMC in the search bar. Well, that was fun. Welcome back. We're going to get into TikTok Toe. And I'm continuing the theme of medical oddities, children thingies, and baby thingies. Because why not? So, tic-tac-toe is right around the corner. There are no corners because this is just some audio. Hey, I don't know how many people listen to the show. And I'm doing whatever because I don't know. if Will someone listen to this and be like, hey, stop singing. You're weird. And then I'll be like, I'm supposed to be. And they'll be like, oh. Um, and then I get fired. Cool. We're going to start us off with this bliss. User this bliss. This is just a reminder for men that scientists have now discovered a way for women to impregnate themselves using their own bone marrow. And the only child that can result from those pregnancies are female. So we no longer have any need for you genetically or physically. So, you know, tread lightly. <laughs> how is that child just not like your clone or something? I, I'm sure it's not, but how is it not? Because maybe they take not your DNA. They take what? I don't know. Can someone please explain this to me? Maybe I'll ask Siri. I'm, I'm talking to Siri, not Google this week. We're trying a little something different. Hey, Siri, when you make children with bone marrow, are they your clone? I found this on the web. Oh, you're not going to tell me. Hmm. Let me read one of these articles. Okay, so it made me read an article because it's very mean. Some scientists doubt that sperm made from bone marrow could ever be functional enough to inseminate an egg successfully. A biologist at Stanford University points out that earlier attempts to create offspring with a sperm from embryonic stem cells resulted in short-lived mouse pups. Short-lived. That were either giants or midgets. Are we allowed to say midgets? Oh, no, I have to Google that. Hold on. Oh, my God. You guys, I just Googled it. Midget is derivative from the word midge, which means sandfly. You guys, it's not okay. It literally means gnat or sandfly. And quote, it automatically dehumanizes people. Yeah, you think? So midget has no medical connotation, but dwarf does. So even though it might feel weird to say dwarf, dwarfism is a medical term. Midget is just crazy. Crap. And in conclusion, midget is, it says that midget needs to be recognized as a form of hate speech. This is from BigIssueNorth.com, written by Erin Pritchard, a lecturer in disability studies, and she herself is a dwarf. All of those detours, and now we're getting back to the task at hand, which is talking about inseminating using bone marrow. Continuing on. 
The Doctor Who created this technology says it's possible that transplanting his immature sperm cells into human testes could make them functional. But he's awaiting permission for that experiment from his institute's ethics board. What did I just read? Transplanting immature sperm cells into human testes could make them functional. So then why do we need them? Or, or is he saying that people whose testes aren't working can get this treatment? Okay, okay, yeah, okay, that's probably the one. <laughs> what? What rabbit hole have I... Why? I feel... I've been, I'm victimizing myself at this point. I can't believe I just read that. I mean, and he's waiting for permission from an ethics board. Honey, I hope you wait for permission for the rest of your life. I hope you never get that permission. Just go make... It's easier to grow tomatoes or something with your degree. I don't know. This is crazy. Uh, there's there's just so many babies in the world, and and they're not they're not divided up equally in ways that everyone wants. Like some people can't have them, some people keep having them. So you know they're not divided equally. Figure that one out. Do that. But I guess if you're a scientist, you're just like no no no. I'm doing my sciencey science. Like I don't want to do the Oh, oh God, I forgot to turn my sounds off. Sounds off now. You didn't hear that. Sciencey science. So yeah, I guess if you're a scientist, you're not about to solve like the world distribution of children and unwanted children slash wanted children slash whatever. You're just like, I need to play with test tubes. That's my passion. Okay. I guess we're just talking about kids today. So we're going to start with TikTok user Dr. Hanrin. And let's just hope that does mean they're a doctor. We hope. Otherwise, I'm immediately going to start going by Dr. Moog. Because if we can just start doing that, I'm doing it. There's a new spanking study out. Researchers at Harvard looked at the brains of 10 and 11-year-olds through fMRI imaging. They showed them faces with different emotions and looked at the arousal in the prefrontal cortex. Fearful faces produce more arousal across the board, but especially in children who had been spanked. They compared this pattern of brain activation with the brains of children who had experienced more severe patterns of child abuse. What they found was that there wasn't much difference between brain activation of children who had been spanked and children who had been severely abused, suggesting that even mild spanking leads to similar neural developmental changes in the human brain. This is even more evidence that spanking does not lead to good developmental outcomes for children. Furthermore, it just doesn't work. It teaches kids to avoid the caregiver when they're doing the bad behavior, and it strains the relationship as well. There's so many better ways to change your child's behavior. So what do you do instead of spanking? Luckily, there are a hundred other ideas, and one of them is brought to you by user A Modern Therapist. Here are some healthy ways to discipline your child. Healthy ways to discipline your child, part two by a licensed psychologist. Let's talk about timeouts. Step in initiating a timeout is again, going back to the educational moment and communicate a warning. Timmy, banging your truck against the wall damages the wall and your toy. And if you're gonna keep doing it, you're gonna have a timeout. If Timmy keeps doing it, we go right into the timeout, but explain again. You're getting a timeout because I warned you to stop banging the truck and you continue to do it. Now, a good rule of thumb is to let Timmy sit in a chair or an area without interaction for a time period that's one minute per year of age. At the end of the timeout, we communicate again. Remember, we don't bang our trucks against the wall. The good news about timeouts is they're effective and they've been found not to be damaging in the same ways that spanking is. So you, you know, have these experts saying their opinions about spanking, about timeouts. And what I'm wondering is, are there proponents of spanking? Real expert, scientist, researcher, people who really suggest spanking, not priests, not um, just those life coach type people or people, gurus who start their own movements, nothing religious. I'm talking about real researchers with backed up evidence. And I want to Google that right now. Like, are there people who recommend spanking? Because if there are, mind blown. And if there are not, then what is the problem? What is the problem and why is it controversial to say don't spank kids? I'm going to find out right now because I need to know. Hey Siri, does anybody recommend spanking? 
and again, she won't let me, she won't let me hear that she makes me read it. So I'm going to touch on the link she sent me. And from Psychology Today, the spanking debate is over by Noam Sponsor, PhD. Wow, what a name, Sponsor. I love that. I want to make a character. My name is Noam Sponsor. Do not spank your babies. <laughs> okay. The spanking debate is over. The empirical, theoretical, and moral arguments against spanking are compelling. So I'm going to paraphrase. Quote, most American parents hit their little children and most believe that they are doing something both effective and right, but they are wrong. The scientific case against spanking is one of those rare occasions in which over a span of 50 years or so, a scientific controversy actually gets resolved as various programs of increasingly rigorous research converge upon a consensus conclusion. Ooh, as I'm reading this, I was sad when I saw B.F. Skinner mentioned because I had a slice of life where uh, one of my professors, you know, went deep dive into B.F. Skinner and kind of made us believe his baby boxes were weird yet good because all his kids are like doctors and we're like, oh, it must have worked. And no, you just need to hug your kids. That, that's I, th I think that's the consensus. You just need to hug your kids. But anyway, he's well-intentioned, and they mentioned B.F. Skinner's behaviorist theory, and it predicts that punishment re will reduce the behavior that it follows. If you punish the, the behavior. Yeah, okay. But then they said it's really a misuse of his theory because what what kids will learn is not to to stop doing the thing that was wrong, but to avoid the punishment. In Skinner's book, Freedom and Dignity, sorry, Beyond Freedom and Dignity, he says, quote, a person who has been punished is not thereby less inclined to behave in a given way. At best, he learns how to avoid punishment. And punished behavior is likely to reappear after the punitive contingencies are withdrawn. So after you've been spanked, you tiptoe away and go knock over the plant again at some point. Mm, I don't have kids, can you tell? Because, like, that's something a cat or dog would do. <laughs> but I guarantee, like, a million toddlers have at some point this year knocked over a plant, played with dirt, like, looked at a house plant and was like, ooh, yay, and, like, purposely played in that dirt or did something weird. I, it's, of course they did. Of course they did. Because my theory about children is they are exactly like drunk adults, like a super, super drunk adult acts exactly like a young child. You can absolutely map on the same behavior, the way they talk, the way they cry, the way they get emotional, the way they're confused, the way that their motor skills aren't there. So yeah, children are drunk adults and they should be treated as such that, you know what, they are not in their right mind, but you can, after, you know, 18 years, you might sober them up by the end of it and get them to act right, maybe. But definitely not at the plant stage when they're playing with dirt. You're not going to have any luck. Don't even try. So I really wanted to know if, <laughs> if anyone recommends spanking. Like, we believe in spanking. Spank your children. And I'm like, of course, who, who would say that? And, uh, and I was right that no scientists currently say that. But I found a website that does encourage spanking. And you can't make this stuff. The, the name of the website is fatherly.com. Like that is <sighs> really men, really fathers. Oh, wow. Men get a pretty bad rap for a lot of stereotypes they are known for. And of all the people that I would think would be these like angry bad parents who are not self-regulated enough to calmly deal with the bad behavior of little tiny drunk people, but instead of self-regulating and working through it in a calm, rational manner and, and having teachable moments and learning moments, who's going to be the one who just smack, yell, whatever? And <laughs> the, it's fathers or fatherly.com. It's, it's fathers. Wow. I'm not saying only fathers spank, but I'm saying there are stereotypes about men, fathers. There are. And ultimately, it's the stereotype that they aren't as good parents. They aren't as good ch child caregivers. They aren't as intuitive child caregivers. And of course, I am not saying all men. 
I'm not saying that, but I am expressing knowledge of a stereotype. And I just, I can't believe it. I can't believe the name of, and I don't, they're not scientists. It's just, they're not scientists. They're just dads who want to hit things. I have to move on. I'm, I'm losing faith in humanity. And now for something a little lighter, we're going to do a things I don't understand. I love those. Brought to you by a TikTok user at one mad ognam three bougie three. I bet that says something that I can't figure it out. Mad o mad o g name named bougie three. <laughs> I figured it out, you guys. I'm a boomer. No, okay. Let's listen. Things I don't understand. Part four. And yes, I know I could Google them. And yes, this is my last one. Why is express shipping like they can get it done in like two days, but like regular shipping they can't? Like, do they just keep our package? Or like, okay, like they didn't pay more, so like they get it later. Calories. Like, who knows how much calories is in a certain food? Like, oh my god. Well, I sound stupid. Say it. Comment it. Traffic. Like, if everyone's moving, there won't be traffic. Like, what's the point of stopping? Like, don't break if there's space in front of you. Live photos. Like, once you take a picture, how did it know you were gonna take a picture? Like, if I take a picture of myself right now, how does it know to keep the memory from before and after the picture? Like, how, how do they make underwater tunnels? Do you drown? <laughs> I can't agree more I was, was most of, with most of those. Not all of them. For example, calories. Apparently, you just burn stuff, and however long it takes to burn is how many calories it has, because that's what our body does. It burns it, and then it compares the burning to the burning to the burning to the burning, and that's how they figure out calories. Everyone knows that jingle, right? Mm, it's not a jingle. I made it up. So calories, yeah, girl, just figure it out. But I absolutely agree with the other stuff, like the traffic. Absolutely. I've always thought that. I mean, if we're all just slowing down, can't we just all slow down together? If we're all speeding up, can't we all speed up together? Like, just keep driving. I know it doesn't work that way. It's not a perfect system. But apparently... They have been able to prove that if everyone just drives way slower during rush hour, there will not be big backups. So instead of some people driving 70, if everyone's driving like 35, everything will work. It's, it's magical. It's a miracle. I don't know why. Okay. And then I, I absolutely love what she says about express shipping because think about it. If they always could get everything there in two days, why isn't everything getting there in two days? I think there are, like, especially if you want overnight shipping, like one day shipping, uh, what are we, a princess? But in general, if you can do two day shipping, it, just, why isn't everything just two day shipping? Just make everything two day shipping. Can, can, we, can we get someone on that? Hey, Jeff or hey, USPS. Hey, anyone? Anyone listening? Can, can we get on that? Just make everything two day shipping. Why even give an option of having it take like eight days? What's, what's the point? And I love that. I love that she's like, yeah, tell me I'm stupid. And that's how I feel right now. Live photos. That, that one I agree with. Like you take the picture and it, it keeps going for a second after. It seems like, well, it's set to live photo. So it knew it had to keep going a little bit. What I am amazed at is how does it get the half a second before you push the button? Now that's creepy. Is that like some version of the government watching us or, or the, the phone's listening to us. You know how you'll like talk to your friend about like, I'm thinking of going on keto and like that, n that night on your phone, you'll have keto ads. Oh, now I'm going to have keto ads because everyone's listening to me. And then the final thing she says, I also love it's underwater tunnels because I, I have thought about this. So how do you get it down there? Like how do you get a bubble of air or wh how, how do you get things to not, how I've, I'm baffled, and I think this is just a moment where I need to just YouTube and look and see the process, and then I can calm down about it. You guys, we ran out of time, but I've had fun with you doing TikTok Toe. I am your host, Moog, with the Weird News Podcast, brought to you by the GSMC Podcast Network. We'll be right back. 
The GSMC Life and Happiness Podcast takes you on a journey of exploration. We'll discuss tried and true methods alongside the latest trends of how to best live your life to its fullest and happiest. From psychology to meditation, science to self-help books, the GSMC Life and Happiness Podcast will help you to discover what makes you happy and how you can live life being the best you possible. Download the GSMC Life and Happiness Podcast on iTunes, Stitcher, SoundCloud, Google Play, or anywhere you find podcasts. Just type GSMC in the search bar. Hey, everyone. Welcome back. We're going to keep being weird. We've been talking about medical stuff, children and baby stuff, and we're going to continue. We are going to turn to... A questionably reputable source, the New York Post, where we learn about, quote, fake doctor saved thousands of infants and changed medical history. Uh, <laughs> I just want to preface anything I read from the New York Post that I did, I did look it up because I know it's supposedly not a reputable source. And apparently it is 44% considered to be um, not fact-based. Or not reliable news. 44%. <laughs> Yet here I am reading an article from it. It's also conservative leaning, but it's a fun article, so I decided to go for it. And you will never guess who founded the New York Post. Well, you will guess if I give you enough guesses. It's Alexander Hamilton. Yeah, it really is. He founded the New York Post. Like, how is it still around? Like, he's. In my mind, Alexander Hamilton was a character. Not of anywhere near my lifetime or the most, the past hundred years. Maybe not even the past 200 years in, in my warped mind. Yet he founded the New York Post and 44% not reliable news source. <laughs> and that 44% number is companies that are not biased. They don't have a conservative or liberal right or left leaning bias. They just do a, a wholesome introspection investigation on these news sources and they come up with a unbiased opinion and they are the people who decided that. Hmm. Nonetheless, we are going to continue reading about it. Okay. So it's a story about a doctor who, a fake doctor, who saved so many millions of children. Not millions. I'm being ridiculous, but we're going to learn about that. Let's do it. I, I was I was fascinated by this, uh, that we didn't, that we as a culture did not have any way to help certain types of sick babies. We just thought, oh, okay, well, they're not going to make it. And this guy said, well, we should try to do something about it. Let's figure it out. And I'm just amazed that as a culture, as a science field, it was just him. <laughs> it's like, okay. All right. So let, let us tell the story of the fake doctor who saved thousands of infants, and changed medical history. When Marion Conlon gave birth to twins earlier than expected in a Brooklyn hospital in May 1920, one of her babies was already dead. Her doctor bluntly told the woman and her husband, don't rush to bury that one because you'll need to bury the other one too. She's not going to live the day. But Wolseley, the father, was not going to give up so easily. The couple had honeymooned the previous year in Atlantic City, and Wolseley recalled a sideshow exhibit featuring prematurely born babies whose lives were saved right there on the boardwalk. Resting in new machines called incubators, the babies made medical history while serving as a prime attraction for gawking tourists. Wolseley had remembered hearing that the same doctor had also set up a similar exhibit in Coney Island. So while their own doctor tried to convince them, that all was lost, Wolseley grabbed his two-pound daughter, ran from the hospital, and hailed a cab, hoping the Coney Island sideshow could save her life. A new book, The Strange Case of Dr. Cooney, How a Mysterious European Showman Saved Thousands of American Babies by Don Raffle, tells the story of Martin Cooney, a self-appointed, quote, doctor. His credentials turned out to be non-existent, who nonetheless saved thousands of infants and introduced incubators to the modern world. Good for him. What little is known about Martin Cooney is that he was born in Prussia in 1869 as Michael Cohn and changed his name after immigrating to New York at 18. He does not appear to have any medical credentials, and while he often claimed to be a protege of the world-renowned French doctor Pierre Constant Boudin, who popularized incubators in Europe, there is no evidence for this claim. 
What is true is that whatever his motive, he spent 40 years as the only medical hope for parents of babies born too early in New York City and beyond. Raffle estimates he saved between 6,500 and 7,000 lives. And from there, think of how many kids they had and how many kids they had. So it really turns out to be tens of thousands and eventually billions if the earth lasts that long. (laughs) Incubators were invented in Europe in the late 19th century, the evolution of innovations from Russia, Germany, and France. Cooney claimed that in 1896, Boudin, an actual pioneer in the field, sent him to display incubators at the Great Industrial Exhibition of Berlin. Rather than stand next to empty machines, Cooney, referring to the displays as child hatchery, he said he realized how much more effective it would be if they housed actual babies being saved for the public to see. The truth about where Cooney first encountered these machines and his motivation for making them the great cause of his life is unknown. Raffle believes he did not attend the 1896 exhibition at all, but heard about it and became associated with machines soon after. The exhibition in Berlin made a big splash, Raffle says, and keep in mind, Raffle is the person, Don Raffle, I believe, who wrote the whole book. It keeps referencing her, and I'm like, what? Okay. It was written up in newspapers all over the place, including the United States, and showmen started becoming interested in it. However it began, Cooney toured the machines around America and established a show on Coney Island in 1903, one block away from Luna Park, the amusement park. The exhibit ran in the general area for the next 40 years. Visitors were charged a quarter to view the babies, and the money went to their care. As one might expect, people didn't know what to make of the exhibit at first. A reporter for the Brooklyn Eagle newspaper in a story headlined, quote, Strangest place on earth for human tots to be fed, nursed, and cared for, wrote that the idea of, quote, haranguing and passing throng in an effort to divert its shekels for a spectacle so serious not to say sacred, strikes one as questionable, almost repellent. But by the end of the piece, the author's impression had turned positive, praising the care the children had received. Cooney hired barkers to stand outside the exhibit and attract customers, screaming slogans like, Don't forget to see the babies! In 1922, one of his barkers was a young British actor named Archibald Leach, who later changed his name to Cary Grant. Cooney himself developed into quite the showman, hemming it up for the press and the crowds. Raffle writes, every blistering footsore day, he would station himself at the door to his show. All the world loves a baby, once seen, never forgotten. He never got tired of talking to the public, not even, not even the people who claimed he made the babies himself and asked him where he got the eggs. Sometimes they wanted to order one fresh for themselves. But for all his showbiz, Cooney was in the life-saving business, and he took it seriously. The exhibit was immaculate. When new children arrived, dropped off by panicked parents who knew Cooney could help them where hospitals could not, they were immediately bathed, rubbed with alcohol, and swaddled tight, then placed in an incubator kept at 96 degrees, depending on the patient. Every two hours, those who could suckle were carried upstairs on a tiny elevator and fed by breast by wet nurses who lived in the building. The rest were fed by a funneled spoon. Even the nurses, whose genuine medical degrees helped make up for the absence of Cooney's in instances such as signing death certificates, they understood that maintaining the show business of it all was key to keeping the operation alive. They would often feed or bathe those babies where people could watch, and one nurse would, quote, flash a diamond ring and slip it over an infant's wrist all the way up to its skinny arm to demonstrate scale. While Cooney couldn't save every baby, Raffle writes that most patients went home in a couple months. It's unverified since Cooney never published anything or left any records of his work, but he claimed an 85% survival rate, once saying most deaths occurred within 24 to 48 hours of receiving a baby. If we have a child for seven days in our charge, he said, we never lose it. Despite Cooney's success, there were numerous ways this type of endeavor could lead to tragedy. When St. Louis planned their 1904 World's Fair, they decided they wanted an incubator exhibit, but not Cooney. They contracted the lowest bidder, a doctor named Joseph Hardy, who was fully licensed and apparently utterly ignorant of how to care for a preemie. After the exhibit had been open for a bit, the Humane Society examination found out of the 43 children cared for, 39 had died. Cooney published an open letter in the New York Evening Journal calling it the crime of the decade and claiming Hardy and his staff did not know the difference between an incubator and a peanut roaster. While changes were made, including hiring a new doctor, the exhibit stayed open. In time, Cooney offered genuine evidence of his success. He held reunions, inviting children who had been saved in his incubators. 
1909 in Chicago, he even held a, quote, best preemie competition. That Sunday morning, the children were brought in dressed in their finest attire, ruffles and ribbons, buttons and bow. Martin, fluent in baby talk as any other tongue, was having the time of his life. The winner, a three-year-old named Burton, who was judged the, quote, healthiest, handsomest, and best developed, was awarded a little red wagon. Sometimes his successes came to him. At the 1939 World's Fair, he was approached by a 19-year-old woman who said she was one of the babies he had saved. Her name was Lucille Conlin. She was Marion and Wolsey Conlin's surviving daughter, Wolsey. I have trouble with that one. She went on to become a nurse. Throughout his decades of saving babies, Cooney understood that there were better options. He tried to sell or even donate his incubators to hospitals, but they didn't want them. He even offered all his incubators to the city of New York in 1940, but was turned down. Raffle offers several possible reasons for this. The difficulty of operating the machines was one. Doctors didn't have the resources or training to use incubators properly. An incubator is a labor-intensive process. You had to have specially trained nurses and a low nurse-to-patient ratio. It was too much work for them. Given the popularity of eugenics in the U.S. at that time, there also wasn't much sympathy for these children. Wow. We, th- thank God that one thing has changed. You had a raging climate of eugenics, which did not directly target premit- preemies, but directly target children who had severe disabilities. It was an environment where we only wanted the, to produce the fittest babies. That was a very strong cultural undercurrent. People just felt like these children were not worth saving. Cooney died in 1950 at age 80. That he had closed his exhibit only seven years prior is a testament both to his dedication to helping children and the failure of the medical establishment to take on the crucial job of saving their lives. In 1943, Cornell New York Hospital opened the city's first dedicated premature infant station. The same year, Dr. Martin Cooney closed his show for the final time. He said his work was done. Well, good for you, Cooney. Yeah, it's hard to imagine... What motivated him to to want to save babies? Did he have a personal experience? Did he just love incubating beings? It's hard to understand. Last week we were talking about Zora Neale Hurston, and I had the same kind of reaction of, like, what what motivates these people to hyper-focus on solving one particular thing or bringing one particular art or information or knowledge to the world? And, you know lucky us lucky us that these people exist why why was he so dedicated he wasn't even a doctor (laughs) okay and keep in mind this came from the new york post so it might not be true at all and actually i think i'll google it right now let me find out tell me about the coney island preemie babies here's what i found Mm -hmm. okay there's an article that says This horrific island freak show displayed premature babies for this macabre reason. Sounds so controversial. So, yeah, I mean, some people thought it was great, some people didn't. But, I mean, if if you have to pay your incubator bills (laughs) with a sideshow and the babies make it and are okay, no harm, no foul, question mark? I don't know. Okay, most of the parents agreed to place their children on display could not afford the medical costs associated for, with caring for a sick infant in the hospital. Ooh. Yeah, I mean, I, I think it's an easy choice for almost anyone. I can't afford to save my baby's life. I have people stare at him for a couple months and he lives and I don't have to pay for it. Seems like a pretty easy choice. These are... These are our babies we're talking about. Like, there's nothing more important than a baby to the average person. and Right? Like, so, well, their own baby. Now, this article is calling that story where he held a cab and brought his second twin daughter, the first one died, brought them to Coney Island. They're calling him Mr. Horn. And the other one, they said Mr. Conlon. And... Yeah, like, how how are those facts so different? Just that <laughs> one of these places is not reputable. But, so this is a real story. Maybe not all of the facts are straight, but thank you, New York Post. Maybe New York Post just has slid into this crazy stuff. I don't know. It's not that shocking. Well, okay, it is. To have a sideshow baby, that's pretty shocking. 
Well, we did it. We talked about all the tic-tac-toes and the babies and the children and the spanking and this. And I am very excited to hear in this next segment about twins being conceived at different times. So there are twins of different age in the same womb. Amazing. We'll be right back. Tired of searching the vast jungle of podcasts? Now listen close and hear this out. There's a podcast network that covers just about everything that you've been searching. Hey! The Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network is here. Nothing less than a podcast bliss with endless hours of podcast coverage. From news, sports, music, fashion, cooking, entertainment, fantasy, football, and so much more. So stop lurking around and go straight out to the Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network. Guaranteed to fill that podcast itch. Whatever it may be, visit us at www.gsmcpodcast.com. Follow us on Facebook and Twitter and download us on iTunes, SoundCloud, and Google Play. Welcome back. I'm your host, Moog, and we're going to get started with these twin babies conceived at different times. Let's listen to this clip from Now This, Her. Baby Noah spent his earliest weeks all alone. I had an early scan at seven weeks and another one at 10 weeks. Both times they saw this tiny little baby on there and it was only ever one baby. Until one day, a little sister joined him in the womb. One, two, three... Baby Rosalie first popping up on an ultrasound at week 12. Mom Rebecca and Dad Reese, who live in England, taken totally by surprise. What had happened was I got pregnant whilst I was already pregnant, which was absolutely crazy when they told us because that's not supposed to happen. When you heard that, you must have been shocked. I couldn't believe it happened to me, (laughs) but it did. Um, It's lovely. Rosalie was conceived about three weeks after Noah. With fraternal twins like Noah and Rosalie, usually two eggs are released at the same time, fertilized, and the embryos implant in the uterus at the same time. In Rebecca's case, two eggs were released three weeks apart, each embryo implanting in the womb separately. It's unusual in this case that the woman appears to have ovulated once for the larger baby, and then later for the smaller baby. Called superfetation, a 2008 study found fewer than 10 recorded cases in the world. For Rebecca, it was possibly helped along by the fact that she was taking fertility drugs. Based on Noah's due date, the twins were born about six weeks early. Noah at four pounds, 10 ounces. Rosalie, two pounds, seven ounces. Rebecca's Instagram documenting their development. After stays in the neonatal intensive care unit, both are in good health. You gonna smile for them? Yes, you are. (laughs) Rosalie, a fan of mobiles and Mickey Mouse. Noah, maybe not so much today. They're certainly fans of each other. Definitely reach out to each other a lot. So, Rebecca, do you think of Noah and Rosalie as twins or older brother and younger sister? I definitely think of them as twins. They were born at the same time. Um, They might not have been conceived at the same time, but I still carried them at the same time. Um, They were born at the same time. So, yeah, they're twins. Elizabeth Cohen, CNN reporting. Oh, so it's a CNN report that this now hurt, just stole. And so, but yes, it's CNN. Cool. Okay, so I was thinking about it, and and she said, no, they're definitely twins, even though they were conceived three weeks apart and i think yeah she's right but what about the concept of fraternal twins in general we don't think of fraternal twins in general we would we've never asked the question of are they older and younger siblings or are they twins we don't ask that we just say they're twins but what it made me think is how many fraternal twins might actually be this where one implants and then one or two or three weeks later, the other implants, 
And all the parents know is, oh, you have two babies. And we call those twins. And how many fraternal twins might actually be the same exact case, but we just don't see it. We don't catch it early enough. And and they are kind of older and younger siblings. What makes a twin? If they're not conceived at the same time, then can they still be a twin? I would almost say no, they can't be. But they can be. Oh, controversial. I'm going to get twins, like, angry angry messages on our message boards. I'm kidding. And nobody messages me. But you can if you want to. Find us on Instagram. Find us on Twitter. Find us. We are GMC underscore weird or GMC underscore weird news at the Insta and the Twitter. I am Go Camel Toe at the TikTok and the Insta. Find us. Tell us stuff. Say, hey, listen, I'm a fraternal twin. How dare you? I want to hear it. Or I don't know if I want to hear other stuff like, yes, these fraternal twins trying to run around acting like they're twins when we're really just older and younger siblings. <laughs> I'm going to destroy twins as we know it. You could say that. I don't, I don't know if we need to hear it, but you could say it. It just made me think like maybe more fraternal twins are actually this totally different phenomenon. And we think, oh, the expert is both there at the same time. I sounded just like a chicken. I was like, Burr, right? That was weird. My other thought watching that was like the poor younger sibling was forced to be birthed because there's just no way around it. Like when the first baby comes out, it all comes out. You just can't stay in there for three weeks and keep cooking the egg. You got to come out. So that second baby was forced to be born early. And it's actually a miracle that that three weeks is enough time or short enough time that that can happen. If the baby got implanted, say, two months later or three months later, the second smaller baby would not be probably big enough to be born. And so what a miracle that it was just the right timing in between the two that both babies could be born pretty much without incident. One just a little bigger, one a little smaller. Hallelujah. Goddess. Mother of Earth. Daddy God above created a miracle. All of the monkeys in the sky. Thank you. I don't know what else I can say about that story, but it's pretty incredible. I'm going to move on because I've been wanting to tell the world, something the world might not know, that there is in Florida, there is a manatee viewing center outside a power plant. And according to urban legend slash my friend, Rachel. Hi, Rachel. Baca. She has a new last name, but she'll always be Rachel Baca to me. Okay, that um, that this power plant is the power plant that runs Disney, that powers Disney. Disney has its own power plant to power itself. And I'm going to have to Google this. I For some reason, I like to have ideas, then talk to you about it, then Google it, and then tell you if I'm right or not. I don't want to do all the research ahead of time. I, I like want us to be surprised together. I am going to Google that now. I'm back. Wasn't I quick? I learned so much. I think I'm totally wrong because Disney World is in Orlando, and I believe this Manatee Place is in Tampa. And although they're not that far apart, I don't think it's the same. Apparently, it's Reedy Creek Energy Services that powers Orlando and Disney, etc. Currently, there is no nuclear power plant at Disney. However, this could change in the near future. Because Florida passed a bill that would allow Disney to build their own nuclear power plant. How wonderful. But also while I was Googling, I learned that Disney World has committed to going green. It says the Magic Kingdom is going green. And that was in 2018. And in 2020, we have Powering the Magic with Renewable Energy, the Walt Disney Company. So they are trying to go nuclear. I said that wrong. They are trying to go green, and I see more articles that say Disney World could have gone nuclear and chose not to. And then from 2019, Disney could still build nuclear power plant. Uh, but from what from what I picked up, and again, please correct me if I'm wrong. Go typey typey uh, on the instas or the tw- twitters. I'm going to say. That based on my research, which is Googling, like any person could do, and requires no special intellect, 
I think that Disney is more committed to going green than they are interested in building a power plant, which is good. But let's talk about manatees. So my dear friend Rachel took me to see the manatees at the Manatee Viewing Center. And if you don't look up, you just look down into the water at the manatees and to the lovely boardwalk and the the arching trees as you walk out onto the long boardwalk you you're surrounded by this beautiful canopy of of beautiful bushes and trees oh what a what a nice place as long as you don't look up but if you look up if you lift your gaze there is a power plant a large power plant with big billowy power plant smoke blowing uh yeah that's the experience of the manatee viewing center and it's in tampa it, it's called Tampa Electric's Manatee Viewing Center, the MVC. And it's, it's quite shocking to, to see the power plant. And my first impression was a little bit of horror. Like, are these manatees going to be okay? Or are they going to be like that fish from The Simpsons? You know the fish from The Simpsons. Everyone knows the famous three-eyed fish from The Simpsons that not even Mr. Burns would eat. I so that was my first impression that this is not this is not healthy this is not safe this is not okay but according to Tampa Electric's website the water is taken from Tampa Bay to cool unit 4 now that's like some Chernobyl stuff um flowed clean and warm back to the bay when Tampa Bay reaches 68 degrees or colder the mammals seek out this new refuge so they did not start there it was not a it was not a natural place that they were congregating but because of this power plant it became a place and because they kept coming they they literally made the viewing center they created the viewing center because the manatees were like hey i'm here are you gonna look at me which i understand completely (laughs) i always feel that way hello is anyone going to appreciate all of this hello Okay, we're talking about manatees. So the Tampa Bay, Tampa Electric is a really interesting kind of man-made habitat for these guys. And I read an article that in 2020, an, an abnormal amount of manatees have died. And it's, oh my gosh, the re- they did all this research, did all these studies to find why are these manatees dying? And the saddest reason is starvation. They're starving to death. They have to eat a lot of sea moss, sea grass. They have to eat a lot of greens under the sea in order to stay alive. And there's invasive species, grasses that are covering their natural food. I believe these invasive species have arrived here on boats or however however invasive species arrive in the waters. They are covering the food of the manatees. And the manatees are starving to death. Gosh, this is GSMC's most uplifting show. Manatees are protected by the state and the government. You are not allowed to touch one. It is illegal. Let the sea cows be cows. Don't touch them. Don't do it. I love that in the legal literature, they use the word molest. You're not allowed to touch them, molest them. According to an article in Smithsonian Mag, quote, According to the Florida Manatee Sanctuary Act, it is illegal to molest, harass, disturb, or hug a manatee. The law protects a species which is listed as vulnerable. There are all these articles about people getting arrested, like posting a picture on Facebook, playing with a baby manatee, and then the the authorities coming to his house and arresting him. (laughs) Yeah. The, The entitlement can't believe people people have such entitlement over wild animals. It's like leave them, leave them, just leave them. You know, you don't want a manatee coming into your house and poking you while you're trying to sleep or watch TV. Well, maybe you do, but that is not the point. This is not apples to apples. We can't flip the script and expect the same outcomes. So anyway, these these manatees they they have died because cold snaps forced the temperature sensitive mam- mammals to seek shelter in a certain lagoon. And that certain lagoon has caused a lot of deaths because the waters are more shallow and more sheltered. But there is water pollution in this particular lagoon. And perhaps you don't know why manatees are so rotund, but it's not because of blubber. It's because their digestive tract is so bulky. 
even in slightly colder temperatures, manatees can develop lesions on their flippers that are essentially frostbite. So thick mats of algae have smothered native grasses, which the manatees rely on. I might have said that wrong previously. Forgive me. And temperatures were definitely not cold enough for them to be dying from stress. So yeah, that's why it points to starvation. They're, they should not be starving because more than 4,300 species of plants and animal live in the lagoon where they're dying, the Indian River Lagoon. It's one of the most biodiverse estuaries in the Northern Hemisphere. But algal blooms, algal, algal, algae, algal blooms caused by the pollution have persisted for a decade and uh, it's killing their food. According to National Geographic magazine, quote, these phytoplankton blooms block out the light for the seagrass below. Then the seagrass declines and everything that's dependent on the seagrass starts to decline too. It affects fish as well. When there's a large bloom, it depletes the oxygen level in the water and dead fish float up into the mangroves along the shore. And much of the remaining seagrass below will wither because of this lack of oxygen and the overabundance of algae. And I want you to keep in mind that this overabundance of algae, the algal bloom, the phytoplankton bloom, is caused by humans, by fertilizers running off into the waters and chemicals and pesticides running off into the, the waters. It's human pollution. We did this. Ugh. I, I hope, I hope that this, there's a plan. I, no, I, no one's doing anything fast enough. We need manatees, just the same reason we need sharks, the same reason we need mosquitoes. We we need this this homeostasis, this natural equilibrium of the universe. We we need to do something about it. And me sitting here yelling into the shouting into the wind will do nothing. But you know what? Let's all say a prayer for the for the manatees. And thank you all for listening today. That's all we have time for. Uh, we were talking about babies and children and spanking and twins and so much fun stuff. We had a nice story time where premature babies were saved by a crazy genius, and we talked about our wonderful manatees. That was just off topic because I'm, I was just in Florida. Why not? And if you're thinking of staying at the Motel 8 in Calhoun, Georgia, watch out for the housekeeping. Thank you for listening to the GSMC Weird News Podcast brought to you by the GSMC Podcast Network. Please remember to subscribe, write a nice review wherever you listen to your podcast. That would really help us out. Please follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. I've been your host, Moog, and I'll see you next week.